I get adjusted. Right, you can't really see anybody. It's okay. Welcome everybody to our intimate in-person audience and our much larger virtual audience. I'm so glad that you're all here with us tonight. I'm Dori Scheimer. I am the senior editor of On Point. Uh, I found love on a dating app. I got engaged in the pandemic. And so the folks here at City Space thought I might have some insight uh, about love and dating and relationships in the pandemic. So I'm so glad that you are all here with us. Uh, but you're really here for these wonderful women that I'm so glad are joining me tonight. We have Margo Howard, a longtime advice columnist, daughter of Ann Landers. Janae is with us too. <laughs> Janae Dizen Harris, uh, the now Dear Prudence columnist at Slate. And we also have Meredith Goldstein. <laughs> she is the uh, advice columnist of Love Letters at the Boston Globe, and I'm so glad to have all of you here with us tonight. So you got to know me a little, you'll get to know them more tonight, and we want to get to know our audience here as well. So we are going to have some questions for y'all to answer on Slido. Let's do that. If you go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O, type in tell me more, one word, all lowercase, we want to get to as many of your questions as we can, but first we have some questions for you. So our first question is we want to know about your relationship status. How many of you are single? How many of you are in a relationship, a steady relationship? How many of you are married? So go to slido.com and you can answer that question. Oh, here we go. We have some answers. So most of our audience, oh, well, we'll give it a minute. We'll see. That's we'll fast. see what happens. Yeah, immediate. <laughs> Did you know, speaking of Janae, I was the first Dear Prudence, and she is the current Dear Prudence. Yes, I love that. So, that's so we're going to talk about the kind of advice that you gave as the first Dear Prudence. Janae, the kind of advice you're giving and the kind of questions you're getting now as Dear Prudence, a year into it. Congratulations. Thank so you. I'm sure it's you. changed a lot. <laughs> well, I'm excited to find out if it has changed a lot. So we'll talk about that. But can you tell me a little bit about how you got into being an advice columnist for anyone here who might not know you? Well, it was accidental. I was a straight journalist. I was a syndicated columnist for 30 years. And the man who started Slate for Bill Gates was my editor at the New Republic. He's a brilliant magazine journalist named Michael Kinsley. And he said, you've got to do this. And I said, no, I don't got to do this because I've hidden from advice forever. The, the minute I went in the news business, all the magazines asked me, including Hustler, because of my mother, I think. They thought, right. well, my mother can do it, the kid can do it. So it, it didn't interest me. I mean, I was in the news business. And I was kind of tailing off in my late 50s. And Michael said, you need to do this because I know you're at home in Cambridge sitting on your ass. <laughs> so I said, you know, I don't know that I've got what it takes. He said, you got to try it. And I did it and I made an announcement, I think, in my first column. I said, I'm not going to do this the way the really wonderful, famous advice <laughs> columnist does it. I'm not going to use experts. I'm going to go with my own gut and my own experience. So that was my take on it. Well, and, tell the audience what your experience was in relationships. Oh, well, I had a lot of experience. I was married four times. <laughs> um, and I'd been analyzed, and I had a lot of experiences. <laughs> um, Very well qualified to give relationship yes, advice. Yes. <laughs> and it was a big hit. It, a huge hit. A huge hit. Um, so much so that Janae is now. Are you eight or nine? <laughs> Wait, no, I, I don't know what number I am. <laughs> there have been several prudences. I, I don't. I don't know how many. But the last, at least is... five, probably more. I, uh, okay, uh, so I up the ante with eight and nine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Meredith, can you tell me, tell our audience a bit about how you became 
an advice columnist? Well, I think there's a, a common theme here, which is that most of the advice columnists I love have a news and reporting background in some way, and maybe it doesn't have to be hard news, but you know, but people who like to, who are interested in the business of reporting on people, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that that, you know, I'm not from Boston, I'm from Maryland and New Jersey, and working at the Boston Globe, you quickly realize that people from this area and living in this area are very obsessed with uh, this area. Um, <laughs> and I, I was really confused when I moved here about this, uh, this rivalry with New York that went beyond sports. I'm like, that's a really big city and this is like, I don't know, like, sure, okay. But, but I loved that about Boston, that it was like, no, us, us. And I, and I said to the Globe, you know, they, they had had in-house advice columns. Mario was syndicated um, and I really started Love Letters as like a tiny, I thought it was gonna be like a, a tiny small thing of just like, well, you're here, you're on boston.com, you're literally down the street. And of course the internet changed a lot. You know, Love Letters is now 13 years old and, um, you know, talk about experience. You know, I was already writing stories about the way people interacted with technology and some of you will think of me as this places me in, in sort of age-wise, but like Facebook was newly open to non-college students. So people were like, suddenly it was not embarrassing to be on a dating app. Flip phones were going away. Um, but this was like a, you know, it's, it's a moment, but I remember the first time I met Margo, we talked about our relationship experience and she'd been married multiple times and I was like, yeah, I haven't dated in years. And I thought like, well, it's really good that we're telling everyone else what to do. So I, I stand by that. Yeah. Well, all these years later, you're both still here and people yeah. are still asking for your and advice. We're friends. And you're friends. And yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So it's worked out that this relationship at the yes. has worked out very well. <laughs> <laughs> Janae, you've only been in this position for a year. We just talked about this lasting legacy of Dear Prudence. How did you feel? Were you approached to become Dear Prudence? How did that happen? Yeah, so I've only been married once so far. It's still going <laughs> at this point. Um, I was a lawyer in a past life, and I made a transition to journalism, um, mostly in the opinion space. I was an editor at the New York Times, and I was approached, I think, because of my habit of sharing strong opinions on Twitter. Um, I don't know. I don't know how else they would have known who I was. Um, and I thought I remember reaching out to one of my mentors and saying this job sounds like so much fun. It just sounds like a dream. But if I spend, you know, a few years giving advice to people about their cheating boyfriends and their neighbor's dogs pooping on their lawn, will I ever be able to have a serious journalism job again? And she was like, what other job would you want? And I said, I don't know. So I went ahead and took it. <laughs> Amazing. And, you know, to every news boss who tells you not to share any opinions on Twitter, we have Janae. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you just said you started giving advice in, in love letters when Facebook just opened up to non-college students. So a lot has changed in those 13 years. Have you found that the questions that you were getting kind of at the beginning versus now are significantly different because of technology, because of dating apps? Well, so some things are very specific to now, and the, the, it's so fascinating to me that Janae is doing this within the past year because, you know, there's like sort of pre-lockdown and after lockdown, mm -hmm. right, in terms of the kinds of questions. But, you know, Margo and I years ago had talked about the Bintel Brief, which is um, the, the, first the, one. the really like an old Yiddish Jewish advice column, you know, where advice columns have its roots. and. And we were talking about this with a, a graphic novelist who illustrated these old columns from so many decades ago. And what amazed me was that some of the problems were forever problems. Like, getting dumped is terrible, and it will be terrible 100 years from now. <laughs> it doesn't go away, whereas some problems were so nuanced to the time. Like, I realized in the Bentel brief that when they say bastard, they're talking about someone born out of wedlock. They're, you know, it's like old, old timey, right? So, you know, even in just the time I've been doing this, I can track the advent of Instagram. I can track, um, you know, college students only using dating apps, which I would have thought, that, but you're right around each other. This is like the one time in your life where everybody's just standing there. And yet, and yet, you know, it took me a while to realize. So, so I, yeah, I mean, I, would you, Margo, agree that some problems are timeless? Yes, but the dating apps are a new wrinkle. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a, I want to know why you call it a wrinkle, but but <laughs> I, but it is interesting that uh, you know I think what was a harder time was when some people used dating apps in earnest, and other people were like, "This is some. This is a." point of shame mm -hmm. and then younger people were like this is all we've ever known right so that I feel like has been a slower transition yeah and I want to ask our audience about dating apps so I think 40 some percent of you said that you are single I'm going to guess that you may be on the dating apps maybe you've used them before so go back to Slido let me know if you have used any of these dating apps I'm curious to see I met my fiance on Bumble so we're just full disclosure here tonight. And I feel that was five years ago and there really wasn't a stigma left on meeting. I didn't feel any stigma right. about meeting someone on a dating app. I think the stigma, and let me know if you agree, and Janae, like the stigma is I'm Gen X and that's where the stigma, I think mm -hmm. it was actually people who didn't grow up with it that, you know, my mother, my late mother used a dating, I can't even say an app, she was on a service ser website, you yeah. know, she was, it's like jdate.com yeah. or whatever. <laughs> and it was just becoming a thing. So it took us longer, I think, to embrace what younger people. In the beginning, it was kind of a, a loser shameful thing. Yeah. Like you couldn't find someone in real life. Yeah, like what's wrong with you that you right. can't find That's someone. That's what people thought then. And then it became respectable. I there's a very accomplished man um, on the internet, who, I mean, his internet business, and he and his now wife met on Tinder of all things. Now I thought Tinder was I'm in a bar on 42nd Street. Where are you? Let's hook up, you know, and get together. But it, I, Tinder has even changed mm -hmm. from what it was. I also wonder, like we based a lot of our, like we've been here in Boston, right? And I think even city to city um, things, you know, I think New York and LA probably adopted some of this um, maybe before Boston singles did. You know, it's yeah. always interesting to me to see what app I hear about in different cities. And, and I'm, I'm not surprised that, oh, Tinder just, Tinder Bumped just popped up. out of the red. I, I, want, I want to know what other is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but um, you know, I think of Boston as a hinge and bumble city. That could be wrong. But yeah, I, I dated in D.C. and I feel like hinge and bumble were the same. But even a few years later, friends were, what, what is it? Something in a bagel. Oh, co coffee yeah. and bagel. Coffee makes yeah, bagel. Thank you. Coffee and bagel. Coffee and bagel. Janae, do you feel like you've gotten... Uh, a good number of kind of dating app specific questions for advice on how to navigate dating online? Not really. Um, I think it's just very normal for people to mention offhand that they met on an app. I would say just personally speaking, obviously I was not an advice columnist 10 years ago, but I think it was about 10 years ago people stopped making up fake stories about yeah. how they met <laughs> if they met on an app. Um, and now it's just something you say and don't have to explain or excuse or feel ashamed about it all. Yeah, definitely. I, I remember like a best man at a wedding disclosing that the couple had met on a dating app. And that you was like right. scandalous. <laughs> Early on, people would say, oh, we met, we introduced by friends. We met at a bar. Yeah. No, you didn't. <laughs> you were right. Mario, I want to talk more about you. Your mom was Ann Landers. You resisted a bit becoming an advice columnist. A bit. <laughs> <laughs> and to your 50s, uh, once you took the role, did you feel like you really embraced it I and loved, loved it? it? <laughs> I loved it. And the, the funny thing was my mother was a technophobe. She couldn't do anything. <laughs> so she couldn't read me online. So I would print it out when it ran. I would fax it to her. It would come back edited. <laughs> <laughs> she was always trying to teach me, and she really did love the news business. Did you find that you and your mom disagreed on advice that you gave? No, I don't think so. She thought I was very good. That's amazing. <laughs> Meredith, I think specifically you just mentioned earlier about this kind of like COVID pre-COVID times um, and how that's changed things maybe more significantly in the past decade than dating apps even. What have you kind of found in this COVID era? I mean, it's really been this month to month thing, right? Like where, where pre-vaccinations, um, 
That, that first month, I got some weird letters about, do I really have to wait two weeks? Like, I got, like, medical questions. Like, do I really have to? Which, by the way, like, I don't know if the two of you agree, but, like, the most common question I get that I can't answer because, literally, I am not a doctor. I don't play one on TV is, like, about, you know, herpes. Yeah. I always get, like, I, sorry, I always get, like, questions about, could I have been exposed to this by that? And I'm, like, literally call your doctor. I just don't know. But, but I felt like with COVID, there was a lot, or there was the, the early, what do you think questions about that? And then it moved on to these more practical moments of, okay, well, for people who had had dating fatigue, this like constant swiping that they were so sick of, the lockdown gave them a free pass of like, I don't have to do this. And my not doing this is for public good. And I also heard that there was more empathy on dating apps where like that sort of, how are you question took on like a, well, I know you might not be, like this is really complicated and isolating. And that, there, you know, in the past six months though, I've received a lot of letters from couples long, time couples um, who are navigating two people with different rules. And, you know, my one of the most popular letters of 2021 was from a man who wrote in and it was like right around when Delta was sort of happening. And it was like, my wife wants to have the barbecue that we missed last year with all of our friends. We've got one friend who's not vaccinated. It will be outside. I want to disclose that one person's not vaccinated. I don't want us to have this party at all. She wants to go back to normal. And they're really mad at each other. Mm -hmm. Understandably, there's tension. So it's like, how do we negotiate this, I think has been the most complica complicated question um, to answer. And one letter that I have not run that I probably will not run, uh, just because I'm not sure how responsible it is, is about someone who found out their partner is secretly secretly vaccinated. Um, so I thought this is something I wouldn't have thought, you know, I don't know if she's looking for sympathy for me of all people, but you know, it's like, she's saying, how how dare he? Like it was uh, betrayal that it was betrayal, partner got right? And, and I was like, well, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to write to him. <laughs> I want to tell him everything <clears throat> he should, you know. So, you know, I don't know, Janae, like, this is a weird time to pick up a column because it's now a way of life, these, like, complicated questions we have to ask. Yes, I probably have one letter that mentions COVID at least every week. Um, in the beginning, I would say about maybe eight months, I don't know, I've lost track of time. <laughs> but I did originally hear about a lot of relationships that had really thrived in lockdown when people decided to bubble with one partner and they really became close and were just living in harmony. And then things got complicated when the world opened up, um, not because of risk of infection, but because of other human beings and infidelity and um, jealousy and all that stuff. It's actually it turns out it's kind of nice to just have someone all to yourself in your apartment, not going anywhere. Um, <laughs> And these days, I just I do hear like you, Meredith, a lot about different beliefs and different values around COVID protocols and mask protocols. Um, it's just one more thing to fight about in relationships. Yeah. So I want to ask the audience for, for a moment what you think the percentage of couples are that reported that the pandemic increased stress in their marriage. Go to Slido. Go to Slido. <laughs> Margo's not a technico. Go to Slido. And I'm curious what you all think this answer is, because I was pretty surprised, actually, by this. So we'll give everyone a second to respond. Ooh, you guys are way more pessimistic than I was. Oh, I was going to be like 100%. But this is like, <laughs> but this is also like, you know, I couples with little kids like oh, yeah. the experience i have with friends who have a three-year-old during this versus a 15 year old during this versus you know it's it is it seems like everyone is so siloed in their experience that um yeah i would have said more than 50 percent. <laughs> so that make me a pessimist <laughs> hey you can see it there too we'll give everyone another second but 34 percent of couples reported that the pandemic has increased stress in their marriage but does that mean that the rest of them were like, no, we're, we're good? Or that's interesting. I wonder if for some, it just was the same. I mean, I, I, I feel like everything on the pandemic was a spectrum. Yeah. Like relative to someone with three kids at home, our marriage was great. Yeah. Who knows what that actually, what that actually looks like. Also, another fun fact is that applications for marriage license dramatically declined. Now, some of that is because people weren't having weddings. 
right versus yeah, yeah. they were just putting that off down re- the road in this time i remember at the very mm-hmm. start of this that in china that the divorce rate had spiked so the question was were we going to see like a big divorce rate spike and sociologists like who i tried to interview couldn't quite tell me yes because what they were comparing it to were these other events, whether it was 9-11 or 1918 or one town that had a big tornado. They, there were studies that were done. But one thing they all told me was that everything spikes. Marriages, divorces, like anything you were waiting on, you're like, why am I waiting? So like, who knows what will happen? But the interesting thing about this is it's like there was no end. It wasn't like, it's not like, you know, vaccines just wiped everything away. Like so then it becomes, well, will we see the same patterns and if so how so yeah well i think we're still gonna see that yeah okay we got a question from the audience for margo what is the craziest letter that you've received and what advice did you give that person i've been asked that question i have no answer i mean who can remember (laughs) how about just one that sticks out to you honey nothing sticks (laughs) out Janae, have you had any letter that was super surprising to you that you were like, I'm going to answer this, but I can't believe I'm answering this? (laughs) Yeah, and I have to say that um, the best, most interesting letters also raise a red flag where we ask, (laughs) is this even real? Um, But I just answered them anyway, because why not? I think one of our most popular and most scandalous letters this year was from a mother who worried that her grown son and stepson were in a sexual relationship and didn't know what to do about it. Um, So that was maybe disturbing to some people more than others. Um, I can't remember exactly what I told her, but it did actually fit a larger theme that I've seen a lot of letters, which is um, blended family relationships and how the relationships that exist don't match expectations as far as feeling brotherly and sisterly and motherly and fatherly ties. Um, that comes up all the time, usually in much less scandalous ways. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope so, actually. <laughs> I think another thing that's happened alongside the pandemic is that politics and social issues um, and and a huge push for social justice. Have you, uh, I'll put this to Janae and Meredith, have you noticed um, an uptick in questions about how to manage different values in relationships where someone might feel more strongly about the presidential race or about protests for social justice? Janae, do you want to go? I would say yes. Um, I receive a lot of letters in which people seem to... um, be asking for permission to not like someone because of the (laughs) values they've expressed through um, their political or social views. And I'm constantly telling people, it's okay if someone's outlook on the world makes you feel terrible, if the way they choose to use the political power they have is upsetting to you, um, you're allowed to not like them because of that. (laughs) In fact, you're allowed to not like them because of anything. But that comes up a ton. It also comes up in the context of um, wedding questions, like who to invite to the wedding? Do I want to invite my father-in-law who's going to be ranting about X issue that's going to be offensive to my guests who are more vulnerable? So these things come up all the time and people are really, really wrestling with them. Margo, do you feel like that's one of those things that's transcendent? Has politics always gotten in the way of relationships? You know, I think this is a one-off. I remember Joe McCarthy, I remember Watergate, I remember all kinds of nonsense. It didn't make splits in families where they couldn't have Thanksgiving together. Trump was such an aberration I still don't know how anybody could support him, but a third of the country did or whatever. I don't understand it. And it has ruined friendships. It has split families. It is just, I don't think it's happened before. I don't think it'll happen again. But I will say this, the history of democracy is at last 250 years. So for us, that's 2026. Okay, well, we'll cover that on On Point. My my executive producers here, we will continue to cover that. Um. I mean, I will say that, so I remember back in the day, I mean, I don't remember what year this was. You might remember, actually, but it was Coakley versus Scott Brown. 
And uh, somebody wrote in saying that they were a Coakley supporter. Their husband was Scott Brown, I think. And I and at the time, I was like, well, this is really complicated, right? And now that seems like I'm like, oh, that's how precious, right? Like that. that um, and and we did, you know, I got a lot of letters about. Democrats who had become truly mean and contentious at home about Hillary versus Bernie. Mm -hmm. So that's its own thing, right? Where like there was a level of of sort of I have no tolerance for like anger that and, and I, this is a, a you know a 2016 aftermath thing, um, but you know I would get these letters after we would run the letters about about this um, from people who were married to someone who maybe was like a George Bush one supporter and they weren't and they were like here are the ways we dealt didn't with it up Thanksgiving it didn't no and it was and 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 but it, it, to talk about it, like the the recency of this like we just can't coexist I've been watching Scandal the show for the mm -hmm. first time which takes place or you know started and I think he's supposed to be the 44 I don't, mm -hmm. uh, yeah um, I mean it's like 2011 and I'm like wait these characters are supposed to be a Republican like I just I can't <laughs> I can't imagine a, right, like there's a, a different um, we're just in a different place so I, I it was creeping in that general direction with letters but now I don't like yeah it's like a deal breaker for I think for most people how it's, do you advise people I, I think that, Janae answered really well about like it's okay to rule somebody out for that reason I mean what do you think I'm not writing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I mean, listen. If you don't want to date a Trump supporter, you don't have to. Like, you know, yeah. I think this this um, there was an app, and I don't know if it's still around, but it it was like right around 2016 or 2017. It was called Hater, and the guy who founded it wanted to match people based on what they hate. It was like like guacamole. Swipe, you know, and, and, and it was like you gave, did a quiz of things you really hated. So if you hated Trump, if you hated, you know, whatever. And then it would match you with people who like and hate the same things as you. And, you know, I think it was more a little gimmicky, but it, it, it actually rang a little bit true about here, here are the deal breakers. Yeah. So I want to turn to your personal life. Oh, OK. <laughs> We're half an hour in now. We really get yeah. to have fun. So you are one of the people who found love during the pandemic. <laughs> I have I mean, found a relationship. I will not yeah. put love in your mouth. I don't mean to rush you along. I have been dating during the pandemic. And what's really interesting about it is that I, I was I think I don't know if any of you feel this way, but pre pandemic, I was just really like focused and busy and I don't want and I as people and and having uh, the, the privilege of, of working from home in my pajama pants um, and also being very grateful for company and having the option of a Zoom date, which I'm sure some people were like, what, it, what even is this? For, <laughs> for someone like me, who is really at, at heart an introvert, um, who is always trying to get home. Like on any date I would go on, I'd be like, how can I get home? Even if it was a good date, like what am I gonna do when I get home? What will I eat? What will I watch on TV? <laughs> Suddenly I could be present with other people on a Zoom. And I think that that is something I wonder about, whether for some people who found love during this, is it because they were actually suddenly grateful and present in their own lives? So if I'm talking you know, to the person I'm with, that suddenly I was like, oh, I'm, li I'm listening to him. <laughs> yeah, I also think, I mean, I remember making those like calculations. Like if I go on this first, first date, it could be terrible, and I'm gonna be hungry at 9.30, and I won't, I didn't go to the gym, and my whole night was blown up, and it was a bad first date versus on Zoom, I would think you can do all the rest of those things and still have a date. Yeah, I remember being in Kendall Square um, and being on a date and it was at a restaurant that was, I don't think it's around anymore, but big price of small portions. And I spent the whole time being like, what will I eat when I get home? <laughs> like, what's going to be dinner number two? Yeah. And then I got home and I was like, was he cool? I don't even know. And because while I'm like <laughs> eating my bagel. So I don't know. I hope that Zoom dates are one of the things and, and walks and walks, free walks with someone, you know, on the Esplanade. I, I, I hope that that's, those are some things that stay. Margo, is any of this really surprising that people are dating? I don't know she's talking about a walk. I mean, what is that? <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, you know, listen, I, I, I was like many people who were like, you know, pre-vaccine. It's like, OK, I'm going to try this dating thing. Well, you're not coming in my house and breathing in my house, right? <laughs> and it was also very interesting to see, like, you know, I have high risk family members and I would tell somebody, you know, like I, I, I am probably on the very conservative end of like COVID protection. and. It was interesting for me, I, I didn't do this that often, but if I was gonna take a walk with somebody, would they show up mad? I mean, that's a thing? Yeah, you take a walk. 
to meet. Yeah, you like go, you show up and they, they show up and, and you walk and no one has to pay for anything. Are they vaccinated? Well, this was pre-vaccines, right? This was, we weren't, so walk was pretty much okay, one right. of the only safe options, but but I feel like it also, for somebody with like nervous energy like me, I'd be like, we're moving, we're moving. We're, you know, um, <laughs> although I did have great advice from a friend that was like, you know, I would drop a pin just in case, you know, for safety. I would drop a pin and I'd say, this is where I am and you can see me on the walk. And, and a very close friend of mine said, you're walking really quickly. <laughs> and she's like, are you doing this to work out or are you listening? And I, and I was like, oh yeah, I guess I was, you know, because I was also walking to work out. So that was a you're good You're like, can I do this in a 17 minute mile? Right, but yeah. you're, I think supposed okay. to like walk slowly, but it was like the safe way to do that. But I just hope that like romantic walks, which I don't think existed really I don't remember that ever, somebody ever saying, if somebody had been like, do you want to go on a walk? I would have been like, okay, if you really don't want to <laughs> buy me a drink, I get it. <laughs> I get, but it felt very, you know, I was saying back in the green room that the uh, the show Bridgerton came out December of last year and it felt very Regency romance, Jane austen <laughs> to promenade through Jamaica Plain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, like romance wherever we can find it. No, I think the safety question, and Janae, I want to ask you about this too. I mean, I would text a friend um, the profile of the person that I was going on a date with. I would text them where I was going or share my location on my phone. Do you feel like the, the pandemic has changed some of those kinds of ways that we interact? Like, do people feel safer maybe um, being able to have a little bit longer in that pen pal phase, do you think? I think so, definitely. Um, I remember getting those phone calls too. This is his license plate number. This yeah. is where we're going to be. This is what time I'll call to let you know that I wasn't murdered. Um, for a long period of time there, those in-person interactions just were not happening. And there were just a lot of FaceTimes and a lot of Zooms and a lot of phone calls. So everyone was safe and sound at home. Janae, have you gotten any, um, well, for both of you, have you gotten any letters like, okay, I've been talking to this person for nine months and now I'm vaccinated or I feel safer going out into the world and like, how do we navigate this in-person relationship? Um, not really. And my suspicion, maybe you can do a poll about this to see if the data <laughs> back it up, is that people who were in like or love and wanted to see each other just did it pretty early in the pandemic. Yeah. I think they decided they were a bubble or it was just one person or they were going to get a test first. But I haven't heard from a lot of people who held out a long, long time before seeing someone in person. I held out a really long time. I was not, I was like my, I am my own bubble. I mean, I bubbled with a, I bubbled with a friend, but we wouldn't even go into each other's houses. Like we would mask in the car, but I just, you know, I was very, so it did sort of feel like, well, what? And, and at some point, I did a story for The Globe about couples that met during this, and a few of them were really worried. They were madly in love, they had bubbled, but one knew that the person he was with was a big extrovert with a massive friend group, and what was that gonna be like? He's, you know, like, I get this person every night to myself. What's it gonna feel like when she's When that energy is shared. And I, you know, I would, I sort of wanna check up on all those people and say, who's, <laughs> still, who's still together and who's not? Um, because I had some guesses about how that was gonna work. Gonna but, play out in the real world yeah. somewhat? Yeah. Okay. So I want to show you this photo. Um, on the screen is this couple who've become known really around the world as Romeo and Juliet of the lockdowns. So they found each other on opposite balconies when Italians were outside playing music to I ease their that. hardship. Do you remember this? The music. It feels a long time ago. Uh, this was in Verona, Italy. Uh, you know, old school with this graffiti twist, but Michelle made a banner with Paola's name in the apartment across the street, and that is how they met. And I think, Meredith, like, it is kind of these, like, old-school romantic gestures that maybe we were missing for a while. And I think there was, like, such boredom for some people, and some <laughs> people had to, you know, were going into the office and had to work and had, you know, frontline jobs and all of this, but even with that, you still went home and most likely had isolation. So there was time to be creative. And um, yeah, I, I do think that, yeah, I mean, and, and earnestness, you know, of just like saying something wonderful. And I, I really do believe that, you know, for anybody who's ever been on a dating app, I always like tease my friends who generally are men who do this 
I'm not generalizing, I swear, who their intro line is, how are you? And I was like, what are you supposed to write back to that? And I would say that pre-COVID, like, what, how am I? Like, how, you know, it's like that Broad City meme, like, how am I? Like, um, what does that even mean? Well, now it meant something. So it seemed like a real question. So I do think that, I don't know what you think, but uh, like, I think about the ways you write in the column through many different moments of ways people courted and when they could meet online, when they couldn't meet online, was it always a drink? Was it always a dinner? Like where this would have fallen in? Just like, I don't know. I mean, I feel like you, you wrote the column during some of the hardest times to meet someone nice. Mm -hmm. Like what, what do you think was the most common way people met during Dear Prudence, during your run? The old fashioned way, you know, they met in a bar, they were introduced, they met at school, they met at work. I wonder, and work is I think still big, although not right this second, but I have a, a friend who was, before he was married, met people in bars, was married for about a decade, got divorced, and then he said at some point, going up to somebody in a bar became predatory. Mm -hmm. Like no one was expecting some guy to come up to you while you're trying to like, have something to drink. And he said, what happened? And I was like, oh, I think apps happened. Like, not appetizers, but dating apps, you know. Um, but he Law was like- order people, happened. Yeah, I mean, right. <laughs> so he was like, you know, it used to be that people went to a bar to approach each other. And then, you know, at that point, pre-COVID, it was like, what are you talking to me? You're a str stranger. I didn't even swipe on you. It was that book, Looking for Mr. Good Bar. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, I mean, it's a, it, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a strange evolution. Margot, I want to go back to your marriage experience. Did you meet your husbands in different ways? Yes. You t tell me. Yes. The first one I was fixed up with when I was at school here, not here, here, but in town. And um, the reason that person fixed us up was because he was going to move to Chicago where I lived. And so that was that. It was very unusual. I should have figured it out early. We, um, <laughs> we drove from Brandeis to downtown, and he basically didn't say anything to me. And then it took like 40 minutes. And I thought, isn't that interesting? <laughs> so, and then the second one, I kind of knew in my circle in Chicago, and he seemed like a good problem solver. And I, I wanted kind of a father for the children, their own father was not all that interested in them. And um, he seemed like a solid guy, but I didn't bother to introduce the children first and they didn't like each other. So that was a very brief marriage. Um, <laughs> How long? But three years. Okay. And then a lovely marriage was, I interviewed Ken Howard, who I, this crowd may be too young. Um, his terrific television show was The White Shadow. He was a basketball coach. And he'd come from Broadway, and he was a serious actor. He'd gone to the Yale School of Drama. And that was a really lovely, fun marriage. Um, but I couldn't sober him up. Mm. Um, so, and that was a bit of a problem with the first husband, too. So, but I don't think of myself as one of those women who was doing the same thing over again. I think I get a buy on that. <laughs> you think you were making new mistakes? Yes. Yeah. The fact that they both drank was just out there. Coincidence. And yes. <laughs> and my current, present, beloved husband um, was a Harvard heart surgeon, and my mother was thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> and we were fixed up by. Um, friends who lived here who were friends of my parents. And do your children like him? They love him. Okay, so fourth time is a charm. So you say that you don't feel like you're a woman who was making the same mistakes. What do you feel like you learned from one to two? Or, or the first two didn't seem so good and three and four were good. What did you learn between two and three that you feel like? I, I must tell you, I wasn't thinking when I was doing all of this. <laughs> But I did, I thought about it in retrospect. I wrote a book called Eat, Drink, and Remarry. And it's hard to have a funny book about divorce, but it is a funny book. <laughs> and it talks about, I think it's quite honest, really. I wasn't thinking. I didn't have any qualities in mind. I just wasn't thinking. Now, and I think with Dr. Perfect, Mr. Wright number four, mm -hmm. I think I was trying to put some values in place that I, thought I needed to deal with and have in my life. 
And how long have you been together now? It's like 23 years, I think. So this one's sick. I have a question for Margo. Yes, Janae. <laughs> um, Margo, I get so many letters from people who seem very hesitant to end relationships. Um, either dating relationships or marriage. They'll Not list me. all of the horrible <laughs> things. Right. <laughs> They'll list all the horrible things that are going on, bordering on abuse and deep unhappiness and and say, but we're married and we're in love. So how can I work it out? I wonder um, how you think you knew that it was OK to just cut ties when, and look for something better when things were not working. I, I don't think everybody a lot of people are stuck in marriages and sometimes they really are stuck and sometimes they just think they're stuck. Um, Sometimes money is an issue. Some people, I think, mistakenly stay together for the kids. Um, I don't know if it says anything about me, but when I knew it wasn't good or working, I just, that was the end of it. I, out of there. And I, I was able to do it. Um, I was very lucky in that I didn't need a man around to pay the bills or to do anything. Um, but I, I know that I'm a little unusual in that regard. I am also the first advice columnist to advocate for estrangement in families mm -hmm. because it's something that I knew firsthand. I, I want to say that I've, there are many things that Margot has taught me over the years, and, and one of the things that I try to like make myself do or believe or make other people believe is like when I've talked to Margot about ending her relationships. Sometimes with letter writers and family and friends, there is this unspoken fear, if financial issues are not part of it, of what if no one ever loves me again? Like, what if this is the last person who will love me? And there was like always this vibe I got from Margot that she was like, oh, I'm quite lovable. Someone will <laughs> love me again. And, and my sister has that gene too. It's like, it's like, I, whatever the opposite of imposter syndrome in, in romance is, they have it of like, well, there will be someone else if I want there to be, and if you know, and to live without that fear. And it's not just a fear of like, oh, I could be alone. It's I could be alone, but also, if I go looking, I'm pretty amazing. And <laughs> it's something I try on my best day to like embody. Of, and I don't know if you ever think that about yourself, but I think that. Like I, I, I never thought this is my problem. <laughs> I'm a doer. I really didn't think about all this stuff. I also once asked you once I asked Mario, I don't know if she remembers that uh, this is like a random question that I had asked about how long do you think anybody can be like smitten that kind of early love of just you can do no wrong. And she was like, oh, three years. And, and I was like, that's it. That's all you get. But but it actually made me think of, well, if I am to choose a partner at some point and really be with somebody like you're really choosing also someone who you'd enjoy their company after that goes away. And that's like, you beyond. cannot have a red hot thing going on forever. You just can't. Yeah. So it's like, it, it's a very mature way of thinking like, who's going to be a really good company beyond this excitement and knowing that excitement can last years, but still then fail you. Like that's a way and to a think about pitch. it. Yeah. So, um, but I highly recommend you read the memoir, but also for young, I always say for younger people who might not know White Shadow and also Google White Shadow, uh, but Ken Howard was also in 30 Rock and ran SAG. So I I'm sorry? Like, like Ken also was, Ken Howard was also in 30 Rock and rang this, rang, uh, was Screen Actors Guild. President he Miller. ended his life as the head of the Screen Actors yeah, Guild. But, but, but do, do some Googling. But, um, but I've also met Perfect, Perfect Doctor and it's a wonderful husband number four. <laughs> <laughs> I love Dr. Perfect. Um, we're getting a question from the audience about the age differences in dating. Do you hear from people over 50 about how they're navigating dating? I don't hear from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no one asked your advice they're anymore? They're Meredith. Just Meredith? I think I'm, I'm well, I'm probably the big asking Margo for advice person, but I don't, I, I, the, so the globe, this would be interesting to, to compare with Janae because I feel like with the globe, it's weird because it goes on boston.com, which is probably skews younger. And then it goes in the globe print edition mm -hmm. and then also on bostonglobe.com. And in the print edition, it's getting an older readership and then they email. So like, I feel like in the last few years, especially the range I feel like is wildly wide. Um, because we might have 
a much, much older subscriber who is only reading the Globe magazine in print, holding it, you know, mm -hmm. and still bothering to email. So I don't, if you were to guess, Janae, what would be the age range of your writers? Um, some of them make a note about it. So if I had to guess, I would say the vast majority were between like 20 and 45. Yeah. Um, and when someone is significantly older than that, if someone's 65 or 70, they always say so. And it kind of provides some context for their questions. If they're older, they're writing Judy Martin. <laughs> right. <laughs> I would also say that, and I don't know if this is true for you too, that the, the demographic of readership because of print and Boston.com, and it's such a passive thing you can do while checking anything else. There is a thing with like men over 50 where they always say to me like, I love your column. I know I'm not your demographic. And I'm like, dude, you are my demographic because everyone who looks like you is telling me they're reading it. So like, yeah. guess what? So I think there's this thought of advice columns being a, a woman thing that is um, not true, uh, at least especially for readership. I would say the majority of my letter writers uh, are probably more women, but I don't know. I get a lot of re letters from men too. I, I don't. My I don't mother's know. figures were split. Split, right? Is yeah, it she felt it was half women, half men writing her. And and what I think about your mom, I think about also like the the energy it takes to mail something. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's true. You can hop on on your computer and just send it off. In the old days, people had to write the letter get a stamp, get it mailed. It was a whole, it was serious business to them because it yeah. took energy and effort. Yeah. And, and was it just like a room full of letters? Like what? room rooms. She had three men just handling the, the mail machines that would slit open the envelopes. She had four secretaries and the three male guys. I think that was it. How did she go about choosing? Was that different than how you chose? Well, Which letters to respond it, to? it's just gut, but it's much. It was easier for me because I'm on a machine. Mm -hmm. In fact, she, to my horror, at the age of 57, was on the cover of the New York Times magazine in a bubble bath, <laughs> in in a tub that she had made for her because she loved to sit in the tub. I said, "Mother, you're going to be a prune," but she liked. She had a tub, a marble tub built with a big lip so she could put the letters on there and she would travel she spoke all over the country she would travel with a, like a garbage bag of letters and then she didn't want anybody to read that selma in in um, california was screwing the plumber for you know free faucets so she would <laughs> have those torn up she'd make the stewardess help her you know tear up the stuff so she was really into letters a nationwide production yes yeah <laughs> We have another question from the audience. Janae, I'm going to give this to you first. Um, it seems like ghosting, especially on dating apps, has become so commonplace now that it is acceptable. Do you think ghosting is ever acceptable? I think ghosting is acceptable if someone knows what they did and they should know why they're being ghosted. Like if someone just did something completely out of line or rude or harmful, but aside from that, um, I would happily give anyone a, a short script they could use instead of ghosting. And I've actually done this with friends before. And it's just simply, hey, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I'm not feeling the kind of connection I would want to in order to move forward. Um, I hope you find what you're looking for. Very, Very nice. I mean, I, I am... I have been guilty of ghosting years ago. I really, you know, when the term became like more uh, prevalent, I was like, well, who would ever do that? And then I was like, oh, wait. <laughs> um, because, because like, I remember I was set up with someone once and I was quite sure we both were very much not into each other. And then he emailed me asking for another date. And I was like, well, I think the best way to, to deal with this, and I was younger then, is to just not respond because then he'll know. But what a cowardly way to um, leave it in, you know, because then of course the other person is like, did it go to spam? I mean, I wasn't thinking about all the, all the ways. Um, and it, it is, I think there's a fear of being the bad guy and sort of having to reject, right? And I, I think it's such a, and I also think that for some people they're worried about um, you know, particularly women, they feel vulnerable about being, saying something that somebody's not gonna wanna hear, you mm -hmm. know, if they're, if they've, uh, you know, I think all of us, many of us have had difficult um, responses from people who we have tried to reject or, you know, so I, I understand that, that it is, it takes some courage to do, but I love today's script. Um, 
uh, should like put that on a cross stitch. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I think that I'm hoping that with this time, there's just more empathy. And and what I don't like now is this this oh. this orbiting that I hear more about about what people. They, it's like. What's orbiting? Well, this, I, I, you know, just this idea of they're not gone. They're just like watching your Instagram stories and they're, they exist. This is they're really what, what goes to, yeah. well, well, but not really. They're like, they're like. They're just letting you know that they're there, but I'm they're still not here. saying I could, hi. I could call you. I could find you attractive again, but I actually think ghosting is a better term for that because like ghosts like haunt you, right? Like they don't go yeah. away. That's the whole point, right? I saw Beetlejuice. I know how it works. But they, but you know, in this case, it's with social media, there's this way to just passively like or watch without saying we went out we had a zoom date we slept together whatever and I'm not putting closure on this which I think is like deeply as somebody yes. who loves to believe in you know the fantasy of closure it's yeah I do like one thing Janelle said yeah. and I think she's yeah. absolutely right if you get rid of somebody whether by ghosting or saying look just that's it for us for, it can be a girlfriend it can be anything they know what they did <laughs> Yeah. I do believe you are correct with that. Yeah. People know. <laughs> Whether they want to acknowledge it or yes. not. I don't think my guy knew. A lot of people would <laughs> a lot of people would rather just hold on to the relationship or the the connection, even though there's some big incompatibilities. Like I said before, I think many people would just want to push forward out of not wanting to lose the connection or the experience. Yeah, Meredith, I think I'm with you. I think especially in my like early mid twenties, people needed to be told <laughs> like they didn't know well, why this didn't go well. I'd like to. I, I do think probably a lot of people do know, but I think we all have different ways of. Um, you know, one thing that I learned is that when you have training as a journalist, you're really good at asking questions and engaging. So I can seem legitimately interested. I'm interested in literally everyone as a human who exists in the world, which can be misleading, right? And if you, you know, writers are tricky like that, right? Um, they're, they're interested in talking to you. So I could understand why this person thought I was very interested in every... You might have thought they were a great story, not someone you wanted to be in an intimate relationship with. Yeah, I was just listening. But, yeah. you know, but I will say this, the reason why I really thought it was not going to go anywhere on both sides was that uh, we, we got pizza. And I, it was, the bill was like 16 bucks. Like, you know, we didn't drink. And I pulled out a 20 to pay for both of us and he pulled out a 10. And I am, by the way, not, you know, when it comes to like gender and paying. I didn't pay anything. Well, I just felt like I only had a 20 on me and I was, you know, grateful for the time. I was and, always offended by that. Well, so this is, this is. Because I'm an old lady. <laughs> but, but this is, the, you know, so many of the early years of love letters, people were very attached to gender and, and you know, when, when you're talking about like, heterosexual people and this person should do this and this person should do that and that has gone away quite a bit but I think because I was used to going out with friends I was like eh, it's 16 bucks I've got a 20 on me I'll throw down 20 and I thought that because he was like oh I will pay for my exact slices of pizza that he was like Meredith you were lovely but please go away now yeah <laughs> it's so it was just interesting that we thought we were giving signals that we weren't you know yeah and yeah that misreading of yeah, I think there can be very, like, you know, genuine misreads, and then there are some others that are like, oh, I know, I know. It's a good thing I quit when I did. Yeah. <laughs> the man should pay. Decisively. Well, one, one of yeah. my favorite, more sort of like mid through way through the column <clears throat> letters was from a woman who had slept with a guy that she was in a new relationship with, and but it was known that she was going to go home that night. You know, she wasn't going to sleep over. She had slept, but not slept over. And the letter she wrote in was, he didn't call me an Uber. That was the act of chivalry she had expected, that she was going to spend this time and that he would say, let me get you a car. And I was like, is that a thing that people are, you know, it, it brought up a really interesting conversation. Was with he readers. paralyzed? Why didn't no, he take no, no, her no, home? No, 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 he didn't have a car. He didn't have a car. Oh, didn't have, okay. She, she right. was like, I'm, I guess I'll get on my ride app and, you know, like get an Uber, but she thought he should have said, let me get you a car. So, um, you know, it was just before we were going back to walks. Before, right, right, right. <laughs> but it just goes to show you that this idea of chivalry, you know, even taking gender out of it has changed over the years. Like, you know, this, he hadn't gotten the memo that if you've had a good date, you call the other person the Uber because that's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and Margo will be horrified to hear that sometimes after dates now, people will actually send a 
digital request to be paid back for half the date. Yep. So you'll get a notification through Cash App or Venmo oh. saying oh, your, your part was $19. So it's not even discussed in person. They get to do it like in the privacy of their home. I do know time moves on, yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the Venmo thing is tricky. That's funny, by text, you owe me. Yes, right. You wanted to get that dessert? Well, guess what? <laughs> you can that would be another $8.70 <laughs> Venmo request. I want to ask all three of you, if you have a really, this, this has come from, from the audience, if you have a really controversial opinion that you give in your advice that you stand by, even though you know that it's controversial with your readers. Did you have any of those kinds? I of did. Tell me. I, that was, you know, this is the biggest response I ever got at Slate, and I had a, a very good readership. It was a question about religion, and it was making a commotion in a relationship. And I said, you know, more wars have been fought by people fighting over who had the better imaginary friend. Well, <laughs> you know, you gotta fire her, this is terrible. I, so that was my biggest response situation. <laughs> and I got in trouble for something else. I mean, the it's estrangement funny. thing is, it, which I, I think is a really interesting concept of like, you don't have to have people in your life just because they're related to you, right? Which I think is, perhaps was more controversial pre-2016. Mm -hmm. Well, the estrangement thing, yes. You know, now it's more, but that I think would have been controversial, which I think is, you know, the idea that you don't have to, you know. I don't, I, uh, Well, then I got in it with the whole South of this country, the South. Look, I was writing during the time of AIDS and I would get letters, mostly from young men, whose parents removed them from the house. And so I stuck my neck out there. I said, this is absolutely hateful. I, I, you're well rid of people who think like that and feel like that. And, and that was a big storm. So. Uh, Janae, do you, what do you, have you said anything? I would agree that I get the most, the angriest pushback when I tell people that, you know, it's okay to not want to be around your family who's bigoted, homophobic, racist, or something else. Just saying that's your choice and it's okay leads to some really, really angry responses. That's interesting. Her generation On the flip side. Mind. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, on the flip side, I once told someone whose mother was just really unpleasant and just kind of mean, um, but not like in a particularly hostile way to any group. And I suggested that maybe when they got together with her, they should just kind of treat her as a joke and then laugh about her behind her back when she left <laughs> and just not take it seriously. And people really didn't like that. It didn't go over well. Um, but that's just like something that I sometimes do. It's like, if this person is awful, I don't need to fight them every time. Like, I'm just going to make a note and then we'll laugh about it. Yeah, like keep your peace. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I can't think of anything that is as controversial. But or do you one, have a letter you regret publishing? Well, you know, I I have a letter. I do have a letter that I regret the timing of running it, which was when my mom was still. My mom died of cancer in 2013, and and a, before that, you know, when she was still alive and here getting treatment, someone wrote in about uh, their spouse who had been sick and had been in recovery, and. I unknowingly was projecting, you know, all my feelings on this letter writer where I was like, you know, you, you know, sort of saying my own feelings about, you know, maybe this person as a caregiver is exhausted. Maybe, you know, and, and all these things that I was feeling and my mom called me and she was like, is this about me? And I was like, <laughs> well, this is a husband and wife. What are you talking about? But my mom and I were very spousal at that point and I was very tired, right? So um, I, I regretted the transparency that my mom knew me so well that she was like, you know, am I putting too much on you? But but I would say that recently I was sort of put in my place by some commenters about my assumption that people live in the world, that all people live in the world with a network of friends that is like family. And I think because of my age and because I've lived in a city and, and because of my profession, there are these workplace families and um, chosen families, and so often I tell people in breakups and family breakups, and you know, well, you this is the time you call on your network, your wonderful friends. And I saw in the comment section, you know, Meredith thinks that everyone has 15 to 20 people who 
you know, would die for them. And, and that's you had not, a work husband. Well, I, and I have a work, right, exactly. <laughs> Margot is my work husband. So, um, uh, but not everyone has that. Not everyone wants that. Some people have one person. Some people have been far more successful in romance than in friendship building. Sometimes it's based on geography. But it really put me in my place to think of, oh, well, just because I have modeled my life after the sitcoms I loved that, you know, and the shows that I watched and, um, it doesn't mean that everyone has to do it that way. And if you don't have seven friends or three friends, if you are, you know, watching a certain reboot, um, that, that you can talk to about everything, who would do anything for you, not that those women ever do anything for each other, but, um, but that's okay too. So I think there's this feeling of, I never thought I was somebody who was like, everybody's life is like mine. But with friendships, I really thought, well, this must be, for me, that is far more effortless than romance. So it must be that way for everybody, but that's mm -hmm. just not the case. Mm -hmm. And just like that, we have one more question exactly. before we have to wrap up tonight. Um, so there I are, couldn't help but wonder. <laughs> I, I couldn't help but wonder <laughs> what advice you all have. Hours? How long have we been here? <laughs> Sex in the City reboot yeah. um, is terrible. That's my <laughs> opinion, <laughs> my controversial opinion and advice. Um, a record number of couples are getting married, the most no, number of people are getting married this year than they have since 1980. What I thought the whole thing was down. <laughs> nope. It's up. Really? Yep, I'm going to be one of them. What? Mazel <laughs> tov. <laughs> what, ad what advice do you have for someone entering into their first marriage? If they're thinking about it. My mind goes back about first marriage when Gloria Van Vanderbilt was married at um, 19 uh, to solve a housing problem. She couldn't live with her aunt. And <laughs> so she said to one of the magazines, your first marriage is so exciting. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't think you can really, I mean, people can take in the advice, but I don't know that they can live it. But I guess advice in a first time marriage would be, you know, don't expect the moon, your partners in this together, you're building something together. Um, surprises will happen, but, but the institution of marriage is a really old thing. And just be kind to one another and pitch in and, and have fun. Have fun. I like that. I like that advice. Well, with that, we have come to the end of this very fun hour. And Janae, thank you so much for being here with us virtually. And Meredith and Margot, thank you so much for being here in person. It was so good to be with all of you here in person. Um, we have many more events coming up here at City Space. You can go to wbur.com slash events to see what else is coming up. And we hope to see you all both here in person and virtually very soon. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.